This is a reading from Characters of the Reformation by Hilaire Belloc. Chapter 2. King Henry VIII. Henry VIII, who was the King of England from 1509, when he was a lad of less than 18, to his death in 1547, is rightly regarded as the author of that great disaster, the English Reformation. By this disaster, the only one of the important districts of Europe which broke away from Christendom in the 16th century was turned against the general civilization of Europe. If England had not broken off, the Reformation would have failed, and our civilization would have been today one Christian thing. It is impossible to exaggerate the importance of this historical catastrophe. It has had effects which have gone on spreading from that long, distant date more than 400 years ago to our own time, and those evil effects are, if anything, increasing rather than diminishing. There had begun in Germany a great revolt against Catholicism. It was the explosion of forces which had long been gathering, provoked by the division in the Church itself, the rivalries of popes and anti-popes, and the corruptions in the hierarchy. This revolt broke out in 1517. It was wild and indeterminate in character. There was bound to come a reaction against it on the part of the forces of order, and Europe would have regained its religious unity had not England, much later in the story, broken away. England, at the time when the trouble began in Germany, was very little affected by heresy. King and people were quite normally Catholic. The entry of England into the Reformation movement was an accident, the result of a side issue. This side issue was the desire of King Henry VIII to get an annulment of the marriage between himself and his legitimate wife Catherine, the daughter of the Spanish monarch. He wanted the marriage annulled because he had been completely captured by Anne Boleyn, a young woman of the court who would be satisfied with nothing less than being his queen. He could not get the Pope to grant the annulment, so those who flattered and supported him, and particularly his minister, Thomas Cromwell, gradually moved for the break with Rome. This was achieved at the end of 1534. Henry tried to keep England Catholic, Catholic without the Pope, but he failed, and after his death in 1547, the breakup of religion in England began. It was powerfully aided by the fact that Thomas Cromwell had urged the, the king to dissolve the monasteries and seize their wealth. But of this wealth, the English landed classes, who were everywhere the local leaders, received the bulk, so that it was to their interest to further the Reformation. And it was this financial reason, more than any other, which worked unceasingly to drag England away from Catholicism. The, through so much, though so much else was at work, it will be seen that if Henry had not weakly allowed himself to be captured by Anne Boleyn, and then allowed himself to be pu pushed into the extreme position of breaking with the papacy, rather than disappoint the woman who had infatuated him, England would be Catholic today. And if England had remained Catholic, the Reformation elsewhere would certainly have died out. He it was who started the ball rolling. He did not intend the results which ultimately followed, nor even the results which followed immediately with his own, within his own lifetime, still less the results which followed after his death. It was a passionate, foolish, ill-considered blunder, and was a very good example of the truth that evil comes upon the world through, through men's blind sins much more than through their calculation. To understand the character of Henry VIII, one must begin by knowing that, that, that the, what the England over which he ruled was like, how it stood among the nations, what his own family which was, which had only recently arrived at the throne of England. The England in which Henry was born in 1491 was a country of about four million inhabitants. Scotland was quite independent from it and regarded as a hostile country. The mountainous Welsh districts were not seriously governed by England. They were almost independent. So was Ireland, except for a rather narrow belt on the east coast with Dublin as its chief town. This country of four million inhabitants was only one of a number of provinces, so to speak, of Christendom, for all Christian Europe, Germany, Poland, Italy, the Scandinavias, France and Spain, were felt to be one thing and were, of course, united in religion under the Pope. The various Christian princes and free towns and commonwealths, though regarding themselves as independent from one another, 
all felt themselves to be bound up in one great Catholic commonwealth. Of these various powers in Christendom, the French kingdom, rather smaller than France is now, was the largest. Spain had recently been united by the marriage of the king of Aragon, Ferdinand, with the heiress of the kingdom of Castile, Isabella. Italy was broken up into a great number of city republics and local sovereignties, of which the papal states, lying across the middle of the country, were the most important unit. Germany also was broken up into a great number of nearly independent lordships and cities, but over all of them was the emperor who also had for his private kingdom Austria and the lands round about it. There was a permanent rivalry between France and the German states, and therefore the emperor and the way in which England, though a much smaller country, could play upon this rivalry had a great deal to do with her importance. In numbers and wealth, England was then only about one-fifth of France, or of the German states, but she was defended by the sea, except on the northern Scottish border, was prosperous, and it made a great deal of difference to each of the rivals which side she took. This England into which Henry VIII was born was agricultural. Most of the towns were only market towns, dependent upon the custom of the villages round about. There was only one really large city, London, with about 150,000 people. Norwich, which was the capital of the woolen industry, came next, and Bristol had a certain importance, but the great mass of Englishmen lived in the villages and by tilling the soil. It is important to remember this whenever one reads about the Reformation in England, because that movement was strongest in London, in London, and at first had hardly had hold in the countryside. It was a foreign thing coming in through the seaports of which London was the greatest. If we remember this, we can understand the apparent paradox that while foreign ambassadors and others observe, and other observers living in London speak of the growth of the Reformation, the nation as a whole detests it and rises in rebellion against it. The next thing to understand about the situation into which Henry VIII was born is that the king was everything. The political mood of men in those times took it for granted that one man ought to act for and be responsible for the community, and this one man not elected but possessing the throne of right by inheritance. The king was all-powerful, except, of course, that the church was independent, and also that men were governed in those days by long-established custom, which was the moral basis of law, and which the king was supposed to support rather than to change. Parliaments were summoned from time to time to sit for a few weeks, but at regular and often very long intervals. There was no idea of their governing, but only of their being consulted to see whether extra money could not be provided for the king in times of crisis, for normally the king had to run the country on his own private income, which was, of course, enormous. Taxes as a permanent institution did not exist. They were levied only when there was some immediate and abnormal necessity for finding money for the government, usually on account of a war. It must further be especially remembered that the family into which Henry was born had only just acquired the kingship of England, and they were felt not only to be newcomers, but by many people unlawfully possessed of power. The ancient kingship of England had been in the hands of the family called Plantagenet for hundreds of years. In the century before Henry was born, the members of this royal family had quarreled. The rightful king had been ousted and put to death by his cousin, and there and then there had been a reaction against the descendants of, his, of this usurping branch, and civil wars had followed between the various parts of the Plantagenet family for two generations, but still the Plantagenets were the reigning family, and everyone regarded them as the only true royal blood with a right to govern. It happened about one long lifetime before Henry VIII was born that the widow of one of the Plantagenet kings, a French princess, had secretly taken a lover of low birth, a Welshman employed about the palace called Tider or Tudor. His obscure outlandish name was spelled and pronounced in various ways, whether she was ever married to him, we do not know, but probably she was not. However, her children by him, and especially the eldest boy, Edmund, was playmate to her own legitimate child by the late Plantagenet king, her husband. And that child, of course, became later the king of England under the Plantagenet title of Henry the Sixth. He showed great favor to his little base-born and probably illegitimate half-brother Edmund, 
and married him to a lady who was of the Plantagenet blood, though also a couple of generations back, illegitimate. These two, Edmund Tudor and his wife, had a boy called Henry, and, he, and this Henry Tudor, in the turmoil of the civil wars, became leader of one of the parties. He claimed the throne under the most shadowy right, rights. He claimed the throne under the most shadowy rights, came over with a small army of Frenchmen to England from France, where he had taken refuge, was supported by a good many of the nobility who hated the last Plantagenet king, Richard III, and with their help, won the Battle of Bosworth, where this last Plantagenet king, Richard III, was killed. Henry Tudor then took the throne of England and started a new dynasty under the title of Henry VII. As he had hardly any claim, he strengthened his position by marrying the heiress of the Plantagenets. She was the niece of the last king, who had no children, and was the daughter of the last king's brother, who had been king of England under the title of Edward IV. All this happened in 1485, only six years before Henry VIII was born. So we see that, so we see of what a new and unstable royal family that child came. Henry VII, the first Tudor king, and his wife had two sons as well as daughters. The eldest son was called Arthur, and the second Henry, who became Henry VIII. Arthur was some years older than Henry and was the heir. In these two sons mixed two very different kinds of blood, the queen, their mother, being the daughter of Edward IV, the handsomest man of his time, and her beautiful mother being of the fine Woodville family, handed on the strong physique, good health, vigor, and the rest of these families. On the Tudor side, the blood was bad. Henry VII himself was frail and often ailing. He had been born too early in his mother's life, and his mother's family was not remarkable for health either. It is important to remember this double strain in the children of the Tudors. It accounts for a great deal. Henry VII negotiated a marriage between his heir, heir sorry, young Prince Arthur, and the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, the monarchs of Spain. She is known to this history as the Catherine of Aragon. They were only children of 15 when the nominal marriage took place, it being celebrated thus early, as royal marriages often were, in order to clinch an alliance. But Prince Arthur died immediately after the marriage, and we can be certain that it was never consummated. The poor young child Catherine, nominally widow of the last heir, was kept on at the English court, and the betrothal was arranged between her and her little brother-in-law Henry. Betrothals in those days, and especially in that rank, were a very solemn affair, almost as binding as a marriage, and though the actual marriage could only take place when Henry should be grown up, yet even for the betrothal it was necessary to get a dispensation from the Pope of the day, Julius II, because Catherine had been, nominally at least, the wife of the boy's brother. It was a disputed point among theologians whether the Pope could or could not give a dispensation for marriage with a deceased brother's wife. Morally, of course, it did not matter in this case because the marriage between young Prince Arthur and Catherine had only been a nominal one. Footnote. Actually, this marriage was a real marriage, but was not indissolubly complete. In order to have been indissoluble, the marriage would have had to be both ratum, or ratified, by the exchange of vows in the presence of the proper witnesses, and consumatum, or consummated, by physical union. Lacking this latter element, the marriage, though valid, could nevertheless be dissolved by the Pope under certain conditions. Editor, 1992. But the point was to prove of enormous importance in the future. Young Henry, being thus left, sole heir to the throne, his father died in the spring of 1509, some months before the boy would reach his 18th birthday. He duly succeeded under the title of Henry VIII, was crowned, and proceeded to marry at once this sister-in-law of his, Catherine, older than himself by nearly six years. They were at first very happy together. The young king was popular, his wife had an excellent influence over him, and everything went well. Now let me describe the character of this young fellow, upon whom so much was to depend. His leading characteristic was an inability to withstand impulse. He was passionate for having his own way, which is almost the opposite of having strength of will. 
he was easily dominated, always being managed by one person or another in succession. From this beginning of his life to the end of it, but being managed, not bullied or directly controlled. It is exceedingly important to understand this chief point about him because a misjudgment of it has warped much the greater part of historical appreciation upon him. Because he was a big man who blustered and had fits of rage and was exaggerated, exaggeratedly eager to follow appetite and whim, he had been given the false appearance of a powerful figure. Power he had, but it was only the political power which the mood of the time gave to whoever might be monarch. He had no personal power of character. He did not control others by their respect for his tenacity, still less by any feelings that he was wise and just, and still less by any feelings that he was strong of fiber. On the contrary, all those who managed him, one after the other, except his wife, despised him, and soon came to carry on as though they could do what they liked on condition that they flattered him. They managed public affairs while he followed his appetites or private interests. That was true of the whole series of those who ran him. Wolsey, Anne Boleyn, Thomas Cromwell, and at the end, his brother-in-law Seymour. The only exception was that admirable wife of his who, through the simplicity of her character and her strong affection, as well as from her sense of duty, treated him with respect. But her influence over him was, perhaps on that very account, soon lost. As might be expected with a nature of this kind, he revolted against each manager, one after the other. He felt he was being run by each in turn, grew peevish about it, had explosions of anger, and would, would in a fit of passion get rid of them. Getting rid of them often meant, under the despotic conditions of that day, putting them to death. That is how he suddenly broke with Wolsey. That is how he broke with Anne Boleyn. That is how he broke with Thomas Cromwell, who had all three done what they willed with him, acting independently of him, showing their contempt for him in private, and ultimately rousing his fury. Every woman, except his first wife, Catherine, with whom he had to deal, treated him pretty soon with contempt, and that is a most significant test of a man's value. He excelled during all the early part of his life in physical exercises. He was a first-rate rider, a good wrestler, a good shot, and un until disease had quite, reached, uh, had quite wrecked his physique, he could endure a good deal of fatigue. A big, red-headed, broad-faced man with a sparse beard, somewhat pale eyes set far apart in a face at first ruddy, later rather pasty. He had an exaggerated fear of death, and, what was inexcusable in a king of his generation, he would never risk his body in battle. He was terrified of epidemics, which were frequent in the crowded, ill-drained towns of that epoch, and he took precautions, often absurd, to avoid any chance of infection. There were moments when the fear of death was a positive monomania with him. He was exceedingly intelligent and well-trained in theology, to which he had first been directed when, as a boy, it was not thought that he would ever be king and was destined by his, fa by his father to become ultimately Archbishop of Canterbury. He was also well-read, could speak and even think in French, as was the custom in the better instructed upper class of his time in all Western countries, and especially in England. It must be remembered that within a hundred years of his birth, the English upper class spoke French only. English had only recently become the common tongue. But though he was intelligent in the sense of being able to follow a logical pro process clearly, or to draw up a consecutive plan, or to analyze intellectual propositions, such as are presented by the theological or political discussions, he was a bad judge of men. He could see indeed well enough that this man or that was working hard and producing results, but he blundered badly whenever he tried to frame a foreign policy for himself. Also, he was very hesitant, perhaps because he was half consciously recognized, perhaps because he half consciously recognized his incompetence in dealing with a complicated situation. He would put off decision, advance towards a certain end, and then draw back, half determining to give up objects towards which he was bent, and the main lines of action during his reign were always undertaken by somebody else. It was Wolsey who conducted his early foreign policy entirely. It was Cromwell who later worked his breach with Rome. It was Seymour who, at the end of his life, 
determined what sort of will he should lead and how the succession to his throne should be arranged. He was emotional after a fashion, and especially sensitive to music. He was even a good practical musician himself, and something of a poet, and he composed a few songs which are not without merit, as well as other set pieces of harmony, notably two masses to which are given his name, but which are perhaps not from his own hand. He was very vain, vain of his looks and of his athletics in early life, exceedingly touchy about his dignity and his majesty as a king. His feelings were here in comic contrast with the way in which he was always being got the better of by other people, until the moment when the regular explosion against their control arrived. It was this vanity which made him fall a victim to more than one woman, but it also prevented his being completely infatuated by them, save in the one case of Anne Boleyn. Was he industrious? The answer to this question must be as carefully sized as the answer to that other question we have already dealt with, the question of his strength. Just as he was certainly not really strong, so he was not really industrious in the sense of troubling himself to master a subject or a policy by concentrated application. He could never force himself to do things he was not too much of the slave of appetite and caprice for that. Yet one may call him industrious in the more superficial sense of the word, of getting through agenda and attending to what was put before him as a monarch. There is a vast mass of papers, many drawn up with his own hand, a great deal of annotations of documents with which he had to deal, which proved this quality in him. One cannot use for him the word lazy. He did not simply leave all work to other people and forget it in amusements. But what he had not, in this any more than in other matters, that control of himself, that grasp over his own activities, that power of compelling himself to do what he felt to be tedious, which is the mark of true industry. He did not work in the full sense of the word, he never got into the depth of anything. He undertook to study or become the possessor of it. Next, we must especially insist upon the effect which time had upon his character, time and disease combined. At some date, which we cannot exactly determine, but certainly early in his life, probably well before his 24th year, he contracted syphilis. Thenceforward, he gradually became a man deteriorating more and more in body and mind. He long retained his physical activity, and to the end his mental activity. But he was more warped on the spiritual side, until at last he became something of a monster, callous to the sufferings of others, and capable of almost any cruelty in action. While on the physical side his health went all to pieces, especially towards the end. For years, the chief symptom of his troubles was a running ulcer in the leg, and for the last quarter of his reign, he had become so huge, unwieldy, and corrupt in person that he could hardly move. In the final years, though, he was only a little over fifty, he had to be trundled about, and his enormous bulk lifted in and out of a chair. At last, he could not even sign his name. It had to be done for him, with a stamp. But even to the very end, he retained that sort of energy which takes its expression in violence. He had, as, he, as might be imagined, very little power of self-restraint, and he never seems to have undertook, understood when this lack of, of control passed the bounds of common decency. Thus he would cry absurdly, almost like a child, especially when he was in a fit of passion or when he felt he had been made ridiculous. Two last things must be mentioned about him, the first of which is very generally appreciated, the second of which is too often forgotten. The first is that his extreme selfishness, which grew upon him with the years, as selfishness always does in selfish men, probably passed at last the boundary of sanity, and this showed itself especially in the horrible acts of cruelty in the last part of his career. There had been plenty of cruelty in him when his character first began to deteriorate, after Catherine lost her influence over him, and after his disease had begun to work, but there were other political or personal reasons for it. While later it was often merely wanton, and he would express in the orders he gave a, short, a sort of hellish savagery and greed of suffering and gloat over the agonies of his victims, such as those of the unfortunate Friar Forest, whom he had roasted over a slow fire. And he mixed up horrors of this sort with the idea of grandeur. He seemed to think that they enhanced his stature in the eyes of his contemporaries and subjects. He became at last, he came at last to rule by terror, 
and the extravagance of his later policy, such as the expedition to Boulogne, his sudden changes, and his violent laws and edicts show a crazy lack of balance. But the second characteristic, most incongruous with such a character, but undoubtedly present, was a strong attachment to the religious traditions in which he had been brought up. This was the only fixed thing in him approaching a principle. He destroyed or allowed to be destroyed the monastic institutions, which are the bulwark of the church. He quarreled and broke with the papacy, which is the principal unity in the church, though in his time a principle confused and often debated. But he did have a fixed emotional attachment to the practices of the faith, and he never got out of what may be called the atmosphere of these practices. He had a constant devotion to the sacrament of the altar, and no little of his severity appeared in his treatment of anyone who denied the real presence. He insisted on the celibacy of the clergy, on the maintenance of full ritual in the liturgy, and all ecclesiastical discipline under the episcopacy, episcopacy which he formerly maintained. I have said that this side of him may appear incongruous with all the rest, and it is certainly strange in our modern eyes, but it is not so difficult to understand it if we put ourselves in the position of his office at his and his time. He was sincere in these feelings, but his sincerity was reinforced by his vanity and by his constant insistence upon his political power. He thought of heresy under its aspect of rebellion. He disliked its variety and its anarchic quality because he lived by centralized despotism, which he had inherited as a 16th century king. And that very emotionalism, which led him to express uh, which led him to his excesses of all kinds, was capable of reinforcing him in those personal habits of worship which did not clash with his political objects. There, as it seems to me, is the outline of the man. There is his character as a whole, in all its lack of proportion, and as he developed, its grotesqueness. None could be better suited to produce the ill effects which it did produce. If the evil powers had had to choose their instrument assigning to it the right proportions of violence and weakness, incomprehension, passion, and the rest, they could hardly have framed a tool more serviceable to their hands than that which did, without full intention, effect the main tragedy in the modern history of Europe.